course in angiography, so unfortunately our laser's not working, but you can see I put the seconds a little bigger here. So basically beginning goes down to the end. And the thing I wanted to point out here is just the really delayed um, arm to retina time. So already at 33 seconds, we don't have you know, most of his arteries filled and, you know, we know that the normal arm to retinal time is somewhere around 15 seconds. Um, so very much delayed arm to retina time. And then you can see later on in the fluorescein angiography, he actually has some disc uh, leakage too, which is going to um, be more relevant. Whose laser is that? Oh, you got it. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Awesome, okay, yeah, so you can see some uh, disc leakage down here at uh, four minutes, 45 seconds. Um, and then just once again, for completion's sake, this is um, uh, uh, fluorescein angiography of the left eye, which appears fairly normal. Oh, I have to switch off. Is there choroidal filling on the right? Yeah, you can't tell. It's, it's so much retinal edema. Yeah. It kind of looks like there is at 20 seconds, but it's yeah, definitely not normal. And then this appears fairly normal. Um, and then, of course, we did a radiological workup at this time. So we did a CT scan to rule out any sort of traumatic optic neuropathy, any sort of fracture and impinging on the opti optic nerve. That was completely normal. We did an MRA brain, MRA neck to look for any vessel disease, and those were both, both within normal limits. And then we also obtained an echo uh, with a bubble study, which was within normal limits. And so um, I actually wanted to go through the MRI and MRI neck and brain uh, because there are some interesting findings there that I wanted to talk about. Unfortunately, Dr. Davidson, um, kind of our neuroradiologist, wasn't able to be here, but he was nice enough to uh, kind of walk me through the different slides about what's important and um, what's not important. So this first uh, uh, MRA that we see is the arrows are pointing to what we see is the ophthalmic artery. It's not the best study, probably some motion artifact, and this was not a dedicated MRA of the orbits specifically, but we can see a short segment of um, the ophthalmic artery. Usually we can see a little bit of a longer segment, but for this particular study, this would be considered within normal limits. And then this is the uh, MRA of the neck, which of course what we're looking for here is any sort of carotid artery dissection, which um, we don't see here. And then this is the interesting slide um, that I wanted to point out. So the diffusion signal is asymmetric at the posterior right globe. So you can see right about here, um, we see this uh, diffusion, abnormal diffusion signal. And, this isn't usually a location that we can interpret confidently. Um, it's an area that has a lot of artifact due to um, on these diffusion images. Um, but when we see, when we look at this ADC map on, I guess when you're looking up here on the left right here, this is how we confirm a diffusion abnormality. And so basically if you see um, black over here, that, that means that it's a fairly real diffusion abnormality. And um, like I mentioned before, this isn't the best study for it. It was not an orbit study, but in the context of retinal ischemia, which we saw in fluorescein angiography, this is probably real. And the cool thing about it is that um, if you look at where this diffusion abnormality is, so you really can't see the optic nerve, um, but it, you know, it's just temporal to the optic nerve. And what's temporal to the optic nerve? That's going to be the, the macula where we saw this uh, diffuse retinal whitening. And so just kind of a really interesting radiological finding that I was actually paged about this um, after the fact the attending reviewed it. Dr. Stagg, you were raising your hand? Yeah, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the decision to do an MRA. Is that like anyone, had they, had they done it already when you, when you got there, or anyone with a CRAO now, do we, what, what looks like a CRA, do we do an MRA? So we're gonna go over the protocol we have here at University of Utah. With Was this. it in response to your, to your, find, your fundus findings? Or yes, they... yes, yep, absolutely. Um, okay, 
So moving on here, this is a, once again his photo. So T2 is um, one of the best sequences for globe morphology, and this is his um, uh, T2 that you know we don't really see any sort of uh, layering, we don't see any retinal detachment. It looks like a fairly normal um, scan here. And then um, so we basically did a, uh, a a pretty extensive workup in terms of. Um, uh, working up this ischemic etiology of his retina, and the only thing of note is, is you know, his CBC had decreased white blood count at 2.9. His triglycerides were a little elevated at 203. HDL was low. ESR, you know, 11, nothing to get excited about. Pertinent negatives, I think, uh, more so are the fact that um, he his A1C was 5.5, so not diabetic. Um, and then his whole hypercoagulable <coughs> workup was uh, negative. Um, and then, of course, his fundus findings really didn't show any evidence of retinopathy secondary to diabetes or hypertension. So keep switching these. Okay, so assessment. He's a 56-year-old male who presents to the ER after being struck in the right eye with the corner of a box. He had hand motion at two feet uh, with a right afferent pupillary defect. Um, his imaging was within normal limits for the most part, besides those uh, diffusion abnormalities. And his lab workup was significant for elevated triglyceride level and low HDL. Um, and so he was subsequently diagnosed with a traumatic central retinal artery occlusion. And um, on his follow-up appointment with Dr. Crum, um, his visual acuity unfortunately did not improve. It actually got worse, went down to no light perception. Um, his pupils, uh, you know, he did have an afferent pupillary defect, like I mentioned, that was um, measured by Dr. Crum to be more than 2.7. His disc had a complete 360 degrees of optic nerve pallor, um, and then his vessels, the, the arteries looked ghost-like and more um, uh, uh, the veins were the only things that were seen. We don't have a fundus photograph, unfortunately, on this follow-up appointment, but we do have a MAC OCT. Um, and I mean, it, the, the big difference we can see between the top and the bottom here is this is on presentation. And then below here, we see just kind of diffuse retinal thinning, which is pretty common after an ischemic event to the retina. Okay, so let's get into a little bit of discussion regarding this case. So most cases of CRAO, um, <coughs> as we commonly see, occur in elderly patients. Um, the main causes are vessel disease of the internal carotid artery um, with embolization of the ocular vessels. Uh, if, to have a central retinal artery in a kid is very, very rare, and it represents only about 8% of all cases of CRAO. And um, this is mainly due to cardiac disorders, contraception, and hypercoagulable states if they are to get a central retinal artery occlusion. What's your definition of uh, elderly and young? I'm uh, I don't Come on, lay it on me. <laughs> Heart pass. I've always been young in my mind. 70 or above, Randy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what the paper defined as that, um, but yeah, I, that was not me. <laughs> um, and so CRA from trauma is even more rare and is generally associated with uh, hemoglobinopathies or coagulation abnormalities. And we're going to talk about some of those case reports. I mean, they're, they're case reportable because they're so rare. And so the first two case reports I wanted to talk about were done by Sora et al. and uh, Michelson et al., who describes two patients, well, a total of three patients, who had a sickle cell trait, subsequent ocular trauma, and then developed central retinal artery occlusion. And the interesting thing about these two papers is that they were two separate papers, but they both kind of came up with the same mechanism of this, what they thought caused the central retinal artery occlusion. And so um, basically optic nerve edema, um, you have increased oncotic pressure, which then leads to vascular compression, stasis, and eventual hypoxia. And when you're in this hypoxic state, we've seen that um, the sickle cell trait patients behave more like the homozygous sickle cell, and so that leads to sickling and subsequent central retinal artery occlusion. Um, for, for our particular patient, we didn't get um, the, the, the test, the electrophoresis for the sickle cell. Um, he didn't um, elicit that on history, so sure, he might have it, um, but unlikely. Why do you say unlikely? 
Well, he's I guess. From Somalia, right? Yeah, he's from Somalia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think you have to test. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, trade is a real possibility. It's yeah. very common. Yeah. And it, is it as common in Somalia as it is in the African American population? Yes. yes. Oh, it is. Okay. Yes. Yeah. But his CBC was normalized. Yeah, that doesn't matter for trade. No. Yeah. yeah. Was it the name? Yeah. Yeah, that might be. That's uh, that's something I wanted to discuss on that last slide. Is should we screen him for that? You know, because now he's blind in that eye. So you know. Um, and then another paper I talked about was central retinal artery occlusion post retro bulbar block. And so this is an entity that is not surprising if there is a retro bulbar hemorrhage associated with that retro bulbar block. But in these four patients, they did not have a retro bulbar hemorrhage, but still experience central retinal artery occlusion or transient central retinal artery occlusion. Um, now, the, the different thing about these patients is they had severe hematological or vascular disorders. Um, so they had kind of this predisposition to vascular disease. One patient had severe type 1 diabetes. Uh, another patient had sickle cell. Two patients had sickle cell retinopathy. And then another patient had carotid artery disease with subsequent ocular ischemic syndrome. And so all these patients, this is a pretty old paper, um, but all these patients were actually undergo undergoing um, laser, and so um, they did retro bulbar block to obtain paralysis of the eye. Um, and so they had several ideas on the mechanism as to how these patients had either this permanent transient uh, or central retinal artery occlusion or um, permanent central retinal artery occlusion. They said maybe the trauma from the actual injection induces spasm of the central retinal artery. Um, compression of the central retinal artery behind the globe by the injected anesthetic solution. Less likely. Um, and then uh, maybe with uh, the epinephrine, there was a study that showed that epinephrine does in, it, um, decrease the uh, ocular perfusion pressure by 50%. Um, and then trauma of the injection induces a spasm of the central retinal artery. So they, they have no idea why this necessarily happened. These were just some ideas that they threw out there. Once again, our patient did not have a retro bulbar injection, but maybe some of these mechanisms related to his central retinal artery occlusion. Um, and then the last one I wanted to talk about, so this study actually looked at five cases of retinal vascular occlusions, not central retinal artery occlusions. So they were terminal vessels, kind of in, more in the periphery. Um, after ocular contusion and otherwise healthy patients. And this was actually a prospective study that looked at all patients suffering from ocular contusions who had significant ocular findings in the posterior segment, like commotio, like vitreous hemorrhage. And so um, they basically examined all these patients and um, they discussed the possible mechanism actually being related to um, stretching and disruption of the intima of the arteries. So the intima um, of our arteries is probably the, it is the weakest part of the vessel. And in other parts of the body, it's actually known um, to cause thrombosis. Um, and so th they thought that, you know, damage to that intima layer exposes um, the uh, blood to that layer, initiating the coagulation cascade. Um, so maybe something, and th these patients had no predisposition. So all the patients that had this significant trauma underwent a fluorescein angiography, and if they did see um, arterial occlusions, they underwent a full workup for any sort of hypercoagulable state they had, if they had diabetes, anything like that. So these patients were otherwise healthy. Um, so a couple of questions that um, remain that I kind of wanted to open the floor up to because I think we are probably going to write this case report up and it'd be interesting to get your all's opinion about this is um, if this truly was a CRAO, why weren't there other physical exam findings, kind of like collateral damage? So if this gentleman sustained enough trauma to cause a central retinal artery occlusion, why didn't he have um, subconjunctival hemorrhage? Why didn't he have a vitreous hemorrhage? Why didn't he have a corneal abrasion like the patients in the last study had? All of those patients had, um, they had cyclodialysis, they had lens dislocation, but this guy's eye was perfect besides that posterior segment whitening. Yeah, Dr. Olson. So <clears throat> it's, it's natural in our mind 
if A happens and B happens, if we assume A cause B. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's a very natural thing for people. And so, uh, obviously, lost vision um, and, and, uh, and, and something happened along this line, but this, this strongly suggests that that trauma was probably pretty insignificant. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine any trauma enough to cause serious contusion of the artery isn't going to leave some sign of something. So I, you know, I, I gotta, I gotta go kind of where we're Paul saying. We gotta look at something like sickle trait or something else. And 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 when you get a significant event, you know, people automatically assume that associated with that, you know, is something that happened around that time frame. Sure. Yeah. And. Uh, um, <coughs> And, and it's amazing how people will, will you know, hone in on that. I'll get them, they say, oh, no, no. And, and it, it could be some of the wildest things that they assume has caused yeah. this particular event. I mean, the most obvious thing we're seeing out there is that, that you know, autism is association with vaccination. I mean, I'm, there are a couple of kids who, who ended up with uh, autism, and it wasn't obvious until after they got their series of vaccinations. And they're still, I mean, they're still out there. And, yeah. and, and and, and it's been completely debunked. There was that one stupid paper out of England, but people still have that causal relationship. And, and uh, when I had a chance to study Swedish history for a long period of time, the, the, the common event, as the days were getting shorter and shorter, mind you, you're talking up where, you know, where, where uh, you're up near the Arctic Circle, is that the fairest virgin in the area, you know, was, was sacrificed and, and it worked every year. The day started getting longer after that. And so That's right. when Christianity came along, they had a hard time eliminating that practice. Because people were afraid that, you know, if they don't if they don't do that, that, that they're just gonna go into permanent night. Yeah. And uh, and so just know that that's just, just the mindset we have. I, I strongly suspect that uh, there, the, the, tra the trauma can be explained with just zero sign. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, so, and then that kind of brings us to this, is like, was the trauma just a red herring, and this was just, in fact, a run-of-the-mill CRAO? Also, uh, you know, talking with Dr. Shakur about this a little bit, you know, it, you know, he, he might have had this CRAO, possibly, and then the box hitting his eye exactly. kind of, like, prompted him to pay more attention to that eye, covering his other one, and he's like, oh, man, I can't see out of that eye. The box did it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It must be the box. So, Dr. Sinclair? Okay, just very quickly, I, in, in, in trying to analyze a case of my own, I talked with Sohang Singh Hey Ray and Ron Klein about their papers, I said, look, most contusions are not directly on, but often have a torsion of the eye. So could this stretching of the optic nerve cause some sort of sheath abnormalities that could cause this intimal stretching and, and problems with the endothelium that then clog? But it was interesting on the MRA that you have there that it looked like there was some lack of staining of the central retina, of the optic nerve that was a little bit posterior to that. So I, I agree with Olson here, and the fact that he lost uh, consciousness for some time, I, I think means more a other associated abnormality. Mm -hmm. I agree with all of that. But I just, <coughs> I, 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 I've looked into this to try to say, is there some other kind of abnormality that could be associated with this traumatic, but the fact that he had nothing in the, in the eyeball, even if the eyeball did rotate up enough to put traction on the optic nerve. Yeah. Those are all just assumptions. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, and, and the, my only question too about the CRAO, so he didn't really have a lot of risk factors. You know, if you look at his other eye, he was hypertensive on presentation, little bit of an elevated cholesterol. His A1C was great though. Not saying that, you know, people without these risk, risk factors cannot have uh, CRAO, but ju just a thought, you know. So I think maybe what we'll do is we'll, we'll get a, electrophoresis and scan for that, um, that sickle cell trait. So, um, I mean, it's extremely rare. I mean, all, all it takes is the, is the right type of atheroma to break off and just happen to hit right at the right time in the right, right place. And, yeah. And all of that can happen. And yeah. Rare events um, still happen. Right. And that's what I tell patients when they have a rare event. I say, you bet, this is something people have told you this almost never happens. But you need to understand, I understand, for you it's 100%. Right. 
it doesn't matter if it's rare for you it happens yeah exactly and Brad I would just add the I, it, I checked sickle cell is very low if, if he's truly from Somalia he is know. from Somalia yeah it would be that's a very low area but if you're talking about any possibility that you're gonna try to publish this a reviewer is going to hit on that right away. We should do that. Yeah, you have to have that just ruled out because it's in the literature. He's from Africa. Yeah, you wouldn't want to miss that. Sure, definitely. Um, okay, and then um, I think to answer somebody's question, I'm not going to go into this because we're out of time. But uh, there is a pulse protocol on um, central retinal artery occlusions that's very applicable to us because we might be one pulling the trigger on the, the calling the stroke code, the stroke team to come in. So really easy to find. I was gonna briefly review that, but just for lack of time, um, I'm gonna let you all read that on your own. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.